first week of our semester. So <laughs> my first class tomorrow. So this is really hard for me to travel. Hey, Neil, nice to see you. How are it's you? So here. You should be nice to me when you go. I'm going to be your German. So <laughs> I was appointed. Okay. Yeah. How are you? Okay, I wish I could join you, uh, but uh, you know, this is uh, tomorrow. I'll give my first class for this school semester, so uh, it's just hard to travel this week. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just say something to make sure everyone can hear you? Hi, can everybody hear me? Good morning or maybe good afternoon. Okay, super. So with no further ado, I, I'm happy to present uh, our next speaker from far away in the US, Hui uh, Kao, who will tell us about using multi-mode fibers for cool stuff. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, Neil, so first of all, let me thank the organizer for this invitation. I would love to come to Como. It's really a beautiful place. It's a fantastic summer school, which I've been before. But unfortunately, this is the this is our first week of uh, semester, and I will teach my first class tomorrow. So, um, so I hope I will just uh, maybe uh, tell you what I have been doing using a multi-mode fiber as a multifunctional sensor, and I'll show you why this relates to the machine learning. Uh, because you know, to extract information uh, from this multi-mode fiber, uh, we uh, I I will show you uh, maybe close to the end of my talk. We have to using machine learning because we just you know other things does not work. So this is really show the power of machine learning. So let me just give a very brief uh, introduction about the multi-mode fiber. I'm sure many of you have known that. So a multi-mode fiber support many you know spatial modes that can be guided in a fiber as it propagates through the system. So it really can carry a lot of information using different spatial modes. So that actually has been used for short haul communication and also for endoscopy because you can use that to imaging, uh, you, know, uh, you know, deep into a body. And uh, uh, people have also used that for like mode sensing. Uh, finally, this multi-mode fiber has been used a lot for uh, high power fiber laser and also amplifiers. So this multi-mode fiber, you know, you can see there are many applications, um, but there's a big issue of this multi-mode fiber. Uh, that is that, you know, if you want to send the light through the multi-mode fiber, what we usually get, because you can have this uh, mode mixing uh, or uh, you know, and the mode interference. So very often at the end of the fiber, we got like a, like a random looking speckle pattern. So this is actually, it is a issue if you want to send an image through a multi-mode fiber, it will get a scrambled. For communication, if you I mean, uh, send a signal, it will also get scrambled. That's uh, you know, very often for communication, people using single mode fiber, and for imaging, actually, people using multi, uh, you know, uh, like a multi-core fiber. Each core has a single mode. Uh, but I want to actually uh, show you that this multi-mode fiber, actually, this speckle pattern is very useful because it contains a lot of information. And uh, if we can extract the information, then we can really use this uh, actually for, like, say, uh, uh, building a multi-functional. Uh, sensing a platform just using a single multi-mode fiber. Okay. So uh, I'll give you two examples in my talk. So one is that if we, for example, uh, you know, this multi-mode fiber, sorry, this uh, speckle pattern depends on the input spectrum. 
In fact, even in the spectrum, you get different spectral pattern. So that's basically tell us we can using this as a spectrometer to recover an input spectrum. And I'll show you next one in my talk is it also contain time information. So that's the time information. So that's allow us to categorize ultra short pulse from this, uh, you know, uh, speckle pattern. And we don't need to use, do time resolved speckle pattern. Just by using a slow camera, we have, uh, you know, a measure time integrated speckle pattern. We can still using this to recover temporal information, ultra short pulse information. That's because the spatial, spectral, temporal degree of freedom are all coupled by this multi-mode fiber. In other words, we're using this complexity of the multi-mode fiber to try to retrieve information. But again, to do this, we actually, I'll show you later, we need a machine learning. And I'll tell, me, tell you why. So let me first, the first part, I'll try to show you, uh, try to retrieve the spectral information. Uh, that is the spectrum. So this part is relatively easy. We, we are doing in machine learning. So how we do this? So we say you have a multi-mode fiber, as I uh, mentioned, if you shine uh, like a, a monochromatic light through this multi-mode fiber, at the output, you will see a speckle pattern. And if we scan the frequency, let me see what I can move it. Uh, oops, let me see whether, uh, sorry. Let me try to see whether I can place this video. Okay. So this is a you know just a commercial fiber, one meter you know step index fiber uh, you know from solar lab, and uh, uh, the core diameter is about 100 micron. So you see that as we scan the frequency, you know uh, this uh, speckle pattern change with time. So that means that this really the speckle pattern will basically tell us what's going on. You know uh, you know what is the uh, you know spectral information okay of this input uh, frequency. So now the question is, what is the sensitivity? You know, we already have very good spectrometer. Why we need to use this to cover spectral information? So let's consider if we can have a multi-mode fiber, then, you know, it, as I said, it, it really excites many different modes, okay, this guided mode. And then when we uh, have a one a frequency launch in, it was excited different modes. And each mode has a different propagation constant. And uh, then that's actually depend on uh, frequency. So when they propagate you through the fiber, they acquire different, you know, phase delay that depend on the path length of this fiber. So that, that depends on the length of the fiber. So uh, then a different mode will acquire different phase. Then at the end of the fiber, you know, we add all this field from different modes together, and that gives us this speckle pattern. So now I try to see that how what happens if we scan the frequency. If we just change frequency a little bit. Of course, this uh, you know propagation constant will change, but they only change a little bit. But it the, for the phase change, it times the length of the fiber, and the fiber of uh, the fiber length can be very long. So that means we can uh, causing a significant change of the phase by uh, for a small a uh, change of this mean wavelength. So that allow us to really uh, detect the change of the speckle pattern due to the change of the input uh, frequency. And uh, what is really the spectral resolution? The spectral resolution uh, depends, uh, you, know, you, you know, this was actually the small change we can detect is inversely proportional to the fiber lens. The longer it is, you know, uh, the more sensitive to this small frequency change. Also, it depends on the differential group delay that is shown here. So that's basically showing that uh, uh, actually we can, uh, using this one here for very sensitive, you know, spectral measurement. So now the question to quantify the sensitivity or the spectral resolution, we actually uh, uh, try to quote, uh, do this called a spectral correlation function, meaning that we measure the output spectral pattern at one wavelength, and then correlate it with the spectral pattern at a different wavelength. And then we try to see how this correlation decays with the frequency or the wavelength spacing between these two wavelengths here. So you see that this actually, this, uh, you know, correlation function will decay very quickly with the you know, uh, frequency detuning. So even for this two meter long fiber, the wavelength resolution at 1550 nanometer is about 0 .03, uh, 0 0.03 nanometer. So it's already fairly good resolution. But we can also make the fiber even longer, then we can 
get into a better resolution. So here shows the experimentally measured spectral correlation in a width as a function of the fiber lens. We tried a different fiber lens, and clearly we see that this uh, uh, spectral correlation width, which give us roughly what is the resolution we can get. And I mean, uh, that's actually coming from this uh, four ways half maximum. And that's basically tell us it's really scales as one over L. So as we said, if you go to a longer fiber, you can have a better resolution. Uh, but the question is that uh, do we pay a, you know, a price? Because uh, you know, you go to very long fiber, uh, typically those fiber are optimized for you know, telecommunication. So even you make the fiber like say 100 meter long, the loss is still very small. So we don't really reduce the sensitivity if we even uh, go to a uh, very long fiber. So now the question is uh, how we can use that as spectrometer, not as a wave meter, because for wave meter, you know different spectral pattern, you can find what is the input, but we want to recover the entire spectrum, right? So, uh, but before that, we need to do a calibration, meaning that we actually using a tunable, uh, you know, uh, laser, and then we couple to a single mode polarization maintaining fiber, and then that is connected to a multi-mode fiber, which we're using that as a spectrometer. And then finally, the output, it is a camera. And then we measure the spectral pattern for different wavelengths, and then we, can, we uh, record it. So this basically is a calibration, tell us what is a, a you know, spectral pattern will be generated by different, different wavelengths. So after that, of course, as I said, we can use this as a, uh, you know, wave meter for different wavelengths. Uh, you, you know, if it's, we know it's a single wavelength, we just compare to see which, you know, speckle people agree with this. But as I said, we want to recover many different spectral channels simultaneously from a single shot. So for that, we actually uh, try to uh, build this uh, matrix uh, uh, to map the input spectrum to the output speckle pattern. So let's consider simultaneously we, uh, our input light has many different frequencies. And that is actually uh, different wavelengths has different intensity, S1, S2, until Sn. Each wavelength will generate a different spectral pattern, you know, uh, on, the, on this uh, camera or this detector ray. But because different uh, frequencies, they, they do not interfere with each other in this time integrated measurement, because we're using very slow camera, uh, you know, so we don't do any time resolved measurement. So different wavelengths, they don't interfere with each other. So for the speckle pattern generated by different wavelengths, we add their intensity. Okay. So when we add in their intensity, you see that for each uh, detector, it, it, the in final intensity we measured will come from first wavelengths, second wavelengths, different wavelengths will contribute. And this coefficient here, actually uh, will be uh, determined by the calibration. The calibration tell us each wavelength, how much they contribute for each different detectors. So uh, if we write the, you know, the, the, this kind of speckle pattern, I know it is 2D, but we can, uh, you know, uh, we can put it into a one dimensional uh, vector and the input intensity as a spectrum is another one dimensional detector. And they are related by this way called transfer matrix. And this transfer matrix, each column tell us what is the spectral pattern generated by each, each individual wavelength. So if we know that the transfer matrix from the calibration stage, and then if we uh, just for any unknown uh, signals can measure this uh, you know spectral pattern and using that to recover the input spectrum, which has different frequencies. So a simple way to do this uh, kind of recovery is just to say, if I just uh, have inverse of this transfer matrix, then times the, you know, the measured speckle pattern, and that will give us this, uh, you know, spectrum which we want to cover. Okay. But this uh, matrix inversion is usually you are uh, defined if we have noise. So typically what we do is that we actually, uh, we can do this minimization. Uh, meaning that we actually can minimize the difference between the measured speckle pattern and also the calibrated matrix times the unknown spectrum. We try to minimize that. And typically we do two steps. We first using this uh, uh, you know, pseudo inversion of the matrix, give us approximately idea where this, uh, what is the spectrum look like? Then we put into this minimization 
that will quickly find the solution. So I basically show you a few, uh, you know, cases which can recover, you know, a spectrum with, uh, you know, multiple lines, or we can also recover a spectrum that is kind of smooth. You know, we have many different frequencies. They all can recover from a single, you know, uh, measurement of the speckle pattern. So, uh, as I said, this actually can give us high resolution because we can using a long fiber. So this is, we actually did a collaboration with new firm. They coil a 100 meter long uh, fiber into a two inch spool. And on one side, we actually splice to a single mode fiber. The other side is just, uh, you know, project the output cycle to a camera. So this is just our, you know, simple spectrometer. But for this one here, uh, we actually uh, can resolve two lines separate about one picometer at uh, around 1500 nanometer. So that means the, our uh, spectral resolution is over one million. So if we compare what uh, is available on the market, you know, this uh, very uh, you know, high resolution spectrometer, for example, this one, um, you, you can see that actually this is a basically can resolve, resolve six, uh, six, uh, six p, uh, picometer, but they have this, uh, you know, uh, the focal length is more than one meter. So this is a really a huge, uh, you know, um, equipment. And uh, also uh, this uh, resolution scales with the dimension of this uh, grating based spectrometer. This is really based on multiple grating inside. So if you want to uh, really reduce the, the, you know, the increase resolution to one picometer, we need to make this, uh, you know, uh, uh, things six uh, times larger. And that's just impossible to use. But uh, for a hundred meter long fiber, you know, this is much longer but we can coil that into a small you know, spool and that allows us to get a really this kind of high resolution. And uh, moreover, actually, as I said, we can recover many different you know, uh, uh, frequencies simultaneously. So this is actually the work that we collaborated with a group in um, a Polytechnique de Milano, which is not far from Como. And, uh, so basically uh, they try to uh, recover a frequency cone that has uh, many different uh, frequency lines. And, uh, and also because all these uh, lines, they are very, you know, they are very close in space. So we need a high you know, spectral resolution. And meanwhile, they want to recover many different lines simultaneously because they want to use this for spectroscopy. So we are actually using a multimodal fiber to allow us to really resolve individual lines uh, you know, uh, in a single shot. So this is basically showing that we not only have high resolution, but we can also have a broad bandwidth. So now the question is where, how can we have so much, you know, uh, so large bandwidth? The reason is because we try to map one dimensional spectrum to two dimensional space. So typically you are using a grading spectrometer you basically, you know, uh, diffract the light in, you know, one dimensional. So you have one dimensional spectrum, then you really, you know, couple to one dimensional spatial coordinates. But here in a, in a multi-mode fiber, we project a one dimensional spectrum to two dimensional space. So then we have many different spatial channels allow us to recover the spectral information. More accurately, there's a number of independent spectral channels that actually we can cover simultaneously in a single shot is actually determined by the number of speckled grains we have. And that is actually also determined by number of guiding modes in this multiple fiber. So therefore, for example, if we have a thousand modes and then we times the spectral resolution, that is a spectral correlation width of this one, that can give us a, what is a total frequency range, you know, we can really cover in a single shot. So with that, then you might say, okay, that's great. If I want to do say 10,000 spectral channels simultaneously, we're just using a, even a bigger fiber that has a larger core, and then we can just even get you know, many more channels. But there's an issue here. The issue is that, of course, uh, I mean, uh, you can using uh, many, many more you know, modes in a fiber, but at the end of the day, as you said, if we want to uh, uh, measure uh, optically dense spectrum, meaning that we have a signal at many different frequencies, and uh, they generate the speckle patterns which we add in intensity because they don't interfere with each other, 
So this basically tells us the spectral contrast skills as one over square root of n. n it is the you know uh, the number of spectral patterns we add. So if you have a, you know say one thousand you know different spectral uh, channels, uh, you know what uh, different Fermi wavelengths, and then spectral contrast is about three percent. Uh, and that's already fairly low. So if you want to have an accurate, you know, uh, recovery, if the noise is on the same level as the speckle contrast, then it's hard to really uh, accurately recover the spectrum. So the call question is how can we scale up? Okay. So to scale up, we actually using this so-called wavelength division multiplexer. This has been widely used for, you know, like a telecom. So it is really a thing, uh, it's really just a one box. Uh, that is, you have a single mode coming in, and then they divide this input signal into many different, you know, uh, frequency band. And uh, each one here, there's a certain width that cover a certain uh, frequency, and then we connect that to one, you know, multi-mode fiber. So we are using a multi-mode fiber bundle. So in this case, then, the, uh, then the, you know, they, they, they all generate different uh, speckle patterns. And then we basically actually, uh, you know, uh, assemble them in such a way that all the output speckle pattern can be measured by, uh, you know, just once, you know, uh, because in this case, we have a camera that has millions of pixels, right? So we can using a large, you know, camera, uh, you know, that can measure all these different speckle patterns simultaneously. And then we can try to recover the spectrum for each individual frequency window. And uh, because you know, uh, also this matrix is smaller because we divide this uh, very large matrix supposed to go to this individual smaller frequency uh, range. So this recovery can be done simultaneously and also much easier because each frequency does not have a very high dimension. So that allows us to get the high resolution and the broadband simultaneously. So here shows one example, which we basically show this recovered spectrum has many, uh, you know, lines here. And then actually uh, we can cover over like say 100 nanometer spectral range and uh, with this resolution about 0.2 uh, you know, nanometer. So that's basically, uh, sorry, 0.02 nanometer. <laughs> so this basically tell us that we can really get high resolution and also very broad frequency range. So that is basically uh, using this kind of multi-mode fiber or using multi-mode fiber bundle for this uh, spectral measurement. So now let's see what um, another advantage of this one. So you say, well, if you're using very broad range, typically for standard spectrometer, like reading spectrometer, we have a free spectral range, meaning that you know if you're using a grating to diffract light, the first order diffraction of a wavelength Will, uh, coin, it will diffract into a direction that is the same as the second order diffraction of like lambda over two. So therefore you cannot resolve anything. Uh, so this determines the free spectral range. You cannot go beyond that because you go beyond that, you get a signal you don't know whether that's lambda or lambda over two. The same thing also true if you're using like say fibro cavity as a high resolution spectrometer, you also have a free spectral range that it determined by the cavity. So you know you cannot resolve uh, which line it is if you go beyond that. So what is the advantage of this multi-mode fiber is that you know we have all this bending, twisting, whatever. So you, you can never get a two wavelengths if they are uh, larger, if they are frequency uh, or a wavelength distance larger than the spectral correlation width. There's no way, there's very little chance you can get a two identical spectral pattern especially if you have a large number of spectral planes. Then it's like a fingerprint. You know, it's very hard to get a true identical fingerprint because of the complexity. So that's basically allow us to really get rid of this free spectral range. So we really can really cover, uh, you know, recover light over a very broad, you know, frequency range. So with that, uh, let me try to just briefly summarize the first part of my talk. I show you that we can using a multi-mode fiber for the spectral measurement. Uh, we can get the ultra high resolution. We have very low loss because the propagation loss in the fiber is very low. And we have extreme you know, broad bandwidth and uh, we can using single exposure to recover many different, uh, frequencies. And so this is high speed. Uh, and also we have reduced the size, weight and the cost. 
But I want to mention is that, uh, you know, when we do the calibration, we must fix the input, you know, polarization and this, uh, uh, you know, input coupling. That's why we're using single mode polarization in the maintaining fiber to really fix the input. Because if you change the input, uh, like say spatial profile or the polarization state, we actually, the spectral pattern will be different even for the same frequency. So this could be an issue, but it's also adding additional opportunities because we can do hyperspectral imaging. The spectral pattern also depend on the input light position, also depend on the input polarization state. So if we have enough degree of freedom in space, we can recover information not only in spectrum, but also maybe spatial or polarization information. But I will not get into that because I want to show you how we do the time domain measurement. Uh, so maybe I'll take a very short break here just to ask, is there any questions? Feel free to ask me any questions for this first part of my talk. Speak now. Hello. Uh, I was wondering how resilient the speckle patterns are to disturbances to the fiber. If you touch it slightly or there are some vibrations, will it change significantly? And how will that impact the resolution and things like that? Thank you. OK, good question. So the question, what is the sensitivity? So I'll show you how this things changes. Uh, you know, you know, we do not do any uh, like a, you know, uh, thermal stabilization or mechanical isolation. So this, or you know, at the you know, you can see that's what we do. We do in the ambient case, and then we just uh, put it on, a, you know, uh, you know, on a piece of aluminum, and then we try to uh, measure speckle patterns, and then we're using our calibrated, you know, matrix try to recover this. Uh, uh, frequency. So just show you very quickly a spectrum. So you you may see a little bit of change if you have sharp eye, but anyway, you can clearly see the recovered line actually shifting frequency. The reason is because we have a, a you know index change. But if you see the Maxwell equation, the the this, this k and this uh, you know the, the frequency and this. Uh, or the index and the and also the frequency they're all together because the, the k equal to n times the uh, two pi over lambda. So our uh, you know calibrated uh, you know trans uh, transfer matrix does not know the index changed. So he thinks the frequency changed. So that's why it actually there's a shifting in the recovered spectrum. So but if you see that for different uh, wavelengths they all shift in the same direction because this as I said this uh, because the index times the frequency, they are, they are really together. So that means if we are periodically standing in like a standard frequency, the Hininya laser, then you can see what is the actual frequency, what is the recovered frequency. Then from that, we know what is the arrow, and then we can recover all the lines simultaneously. Like a standard spectrometer, you always do a calibration. So this is for hard work, this is for software correction. And I have to say that <laughs> our collaborators in, uh, in uh, Polytechnic, the Milano, they are really good at this kind of precision measurement. So they actually put this kind of uh, multi-mode fiber in a small chamber to stabilize the temperature. So now you see that this kind of basically tell us how much drift the speckle pattern, uh, this is the correlation as a function of time. You see this drifting is very tiny. So that means you can do both hardware stabilization. You, we can also do the software correction. Okay, does that answer the question? Thank you. Thank you. And now, if there's no question, I say I want to do a time domain measurement, right? So, uh, so the for the time domain, oh, where's my slide? Okay. Uh, so I also want to use the same fiber, not only measure spectrum, but also measure the you know temporal pulse shape. Okay. So of course, for this electrical field, I know we can write there's amplitude, there's also phase, right? They both depend on time. So we want to measure, you know, that. So I'll show you the first uh, method. We have a reference. The next, we show, I'll show you a method without a reference. So the first one with reference is that we have a known pulse. You know, we have a laser pulse, right? Uh, coming from, a, you know, say a Tai Sapphire laser. And then we basically launch that, you know, it is a nice, well, it doesn't have to be nice, but sometimes it's nice, but it can also be chirped. It doesn't matter. So we send it through a multi-mode fiber, and we send many more. And the different modes has a different group delay, so they propagate at a different, you know, 
you know, speed. So when they're coming out, then when they interfere, they actually form a spectral pattern, not only in space, but also in time. So we call this spatial temporal spectral. So if you see this here at the different spatial locations, we have a different temporal spectral pattern. You know, like, the, like a, it's more like a random fluctuation of the intensity. And uh, this, uh, and uh, this one here, it is actually is a deterministic spatial temporal spectral pattern. Meaning, if we have a fixed fiber, we have you know a fixed input, you know, pulse. Then this is spatial temporal spectral pattern. It is the random, but it is deterministic. So then we can using this try to probe, you know, uh, different you know temporal signals. Okay. So let's uh, let me see whether this, this is working. So now let's try to see that. Oops, sorry. Did you go for screen again? Oh, I go to screen again. Thank you very much. I forgot about that. Okay, so now if we consider we do that, we, we have a known pulse, we send it into a multi-mode fiber. As I said, they all stretched, you know, uh, distorted, you know, and then they have this very, you know, complex spatial temporal spectral pattern generated at the output of the fiber. Then we have an unknown signal, but what we require is this unknown signal is phase coherent or is coherent with this uh, known pulse. So then they will try to combine it with this uh, spatial temporal speckle, and then we try to measure their interference, you know, a signal using a slow camera. We're not to do this time result. We just uh, integrate, you know, uh, this uh, interference, you know, in time. Okay, and then from that, we actually get, uh, you know, a speckle pattern. And we want to use this speckle pattern to recover this unknown signal. So, uh, and this actually can be done with a single shot and we can recover both amplitude and the phase. So why we can do that? Because if you think about it, all these different time traces at the different spatial locations, right? They actually, it's, it's like, a, you can see that there's a different temporal probe and uh, if we're using this, then, you know, and, uh, you know, if they all combine, if they're all, you know, overlapped with this uh, unknown, you know, signal at the different spatial locations, they, they basically interfere at a different way. So eventually, they, they basically, you add them together, and then we integrate in time. So we get this kind of uh, spatial speckle pattern. So that may, and this spatial, uh, you know, speckle pattern has, you know, several terms here. So the first term, it is a DC term. This is just, a, you know, this can be calibrated, right? This is just a output cycle without the signal. And this is the total power of the signal, you know, I mean, of the unknown signal, which we want to match. What is important, it is the interference term. Between. So these two are the interference term. So this, uh, now this interference term here actually can be written in this, uh, you know, a matrix, you know, form here. So here it is the, uh, you know, this ERT is what I said. It is this kind of spatial temporal speckle generated at the output of the fiber. So note here is depend on the very with the space coordinates is also very with different time. So it is, so the space is this, uh, you know, in this, uh, it's, it's in a column and this time it is at a different, you know, it's going horizontally. So there's a multiple time. Oops. And then this is our, unknown signal. So this is a G of T, this was amplitude in the phase, and then this is the complex conjugate. So this is a linear matrix. Okay. So from this linear matrix, if we know the final measured, you know, speckle pattern, and we know this, uh, you know, spatial temporal speckle field generated by this, you know, uh, multi-mode fiber, then we can recover the temporal, you know, pulse shape in from a single shot. Because from a single shot, we, we measure the different spatial locations. So we are using different, you know, this kind of uh, pulse, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, temporal shape probe with this unknown pulse. This is like a ghost imaging. If some of you maybe, this is like a parallel ghost imaging in time, if I would say that. So this basically allow us to recover this uh, unknown pulse in a single shot. So how we do that? Uh, again, of course we can, you know, sending this uh, pulse and then we uh, we have to measure what is the output spatial temporal speckle pattern has been generated. That because that we are using that as a probe, right? So one way to do it is that you have a laser, you get into this interferometric setup. So you know, split the, the, the light into two arms, 
one go to the multi-mode fiber, and then one go to a reference arm, and then by changing this uh, time delay of this, I mean, reference arm, then we can really measure this output spectral field at a different time. I think so one has done a lot of work on that. But we can also do, but then the question is, if you have different reference pulse, you have to measure this again. So we, so then the question is, if we, want to use, if we don't want to do it, we just want to calibrate this multi-mode fiber. So that's why we do this in the frequency domain. So in the frequency domain, if you uh, say that, if I can measure this uh, transmitted, you know, uh, the field transmission matrix at a different frequency, if I have T this R omega, then if I know this for the fiber, does not depend on what is my reference pulse. If I know my reference pulse has some, you know, this is the, uh, you know, uh, spectrum, both amplitude and the phase for my, you know, um, reference pulse, I just times them together. That's basically give us what is output, you know, uh, transmitted field at different frequency. Then, my, then this basically can be for uh, transformed in time, giving me the spatial temporal spectral output. So that's what we do. So we actually using a tunable laser source, then we scan the frequency, measure the transmitted you know, field at a different frequency, and then we can use this Fourier transform to recover the spatial temporal speckle pattern for any input you know, uh, reference pulse. So then here shows some examples. So this is basically showing the some you know, speckle pattern at a different time. And then here shows the temporal traces, there's a temporal speckle at a, a different spatial location. So it's a very complex you know, spatial temporal field uh, structure. And that's what we need to really probe uh, you know, this, you know, this unknown signal. So, as I, so now let me show you why example first. We have to do a sanity check first. So what we do is we have a reference pulse which we know what it is. And then we, uh, you know, one part we send it through this fiber and then we know what's a spatial temporal speckle, right? And then we also send it through uh, this kind of a reference, uh, you, know, uh, you know, arm there. And then we, uh, we actually try to measure their interference pattern. So in this way, we can try to see whether we can recover this, uh, you know, this, I mean, pulse, which we know. Uh, and then the next, out we do this, you know, we try to put in some dispersive samples, and then we try to measure what is uh, transmitted signals, and then we can try to use this uh, to really probe, you know, this unknown signal, this G of T that is transmitted or reflected from the sample. And this still, even though they, because this uh, signal is still coherent with this, uh, you know, with this, uh, you know, uh, output from the fiber, so we can still use this interference effect to really recover it. So the first one is uh, so uh, so so basically, as I said, how we try to recover it, we're using this kind of uh, uh, you know this kind of linear matrix uh, inversion. So uh, now let's first consider if we do not have a reference pulse. That, uh, sorry, we don't have a sample. We just try to measure this uh, reference pulse. Try to see what uh, first. So now let's uh, see that. You know, if we sending this, uh, uh, you know, this pulse, and then there's a spatial temporal speckle. We have a certain delay time for this, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, this uh, reference pulse with the reference arm, and then they interfere with this, uh, you know, uh, you know, spatial temporal speckle. We got this, uh, you know, uh, uh, interference part of this speckle pattern. We subtracted the DC uh, part, and from that we can uh, re recover this uh, temporal amplitude and phase both of them. And we can Fourier transform it, get also spectral amplitude and the phase. Okay, so here shows, this is uh, this is the pulse. And then uh, what I mean also this blue shows what is the phase, uh, you know, and also this is the spectral amplitude, the spectral phase. Okay, and this, uh, you know, uh, uh, a red, uh, this kind of dash line, it is what, you know, we can, we can measure this uh, spectrum using a uh, uh, using a just regular spectrometer, um, but as if this spectrum is recovered actually from this uh, from this uh, temporal field, and we also I uh, actually go measure autocorrelation, try to con uh, try to confirm this pulse shape is right, or or the width is right. Then next we change the delay time. So when we try to uh, try to change the delay time here uh, by by changing the reference arm length. Now this uh, you know reference pulse 
will interfere with a different part of the spatial temporal. So in this case, now this interference pattern will be different. That basically tells us we can tell what is the delay time. You know, we are not just can tell the pulse shape, we can tell the delay time because we, we can tell which part it will interfere with. And from that, we can again recover, uh, you know, the field both in, uh, you know, spectrum and also in, uh, and also in time. And we see this a pulse delay and that is consistent with the delay we actually change the reference on. And then here shows that in the spectral domain, you see this really the spectral phase, it is actually kind of, you know, uh, there's a linear increase that's corresponding to also this uh, temporal delay. So that is based on our sanity check. See, this seems to, to work. And then we try to recover, you know, from, you know, put some sample in. So we are using a double side silicon slab. Uh, then that can generate the multiple pulses, one pulse from the, uh, you know, reflection from the front end and then another from the back surface. And also we have a third pulse coming from this uh, double pass. So again, we try to you know, combine this, you know, with that spatial temporal speckle. Then we try to recover this uh, temporal, uh, you know, pulse amplitude and the phase. So here we can clearly see we have uh, three pulses. And uh, I mean, also, you know, under this uh, uh, black dash line, it is what we calculated, what this pulse should look like. And this also shows this uh, spectral amplitude and phase. So now you see that we see this modulations in the spectrum. That's because all these different pulse, they interfere uh, in the frequency domain. So they generate this kind of fringes. And uh, if we unwrap the spectral phase, we see all this uh, dip at the frequency minimum here. So that is, uh, uh, that is well known. So basically we show that we can really recover multiple pulses, you know, uh, using this method. So uh, then the question is, what determines the temporal resolution and what determines the temporal range we can measure using a single shot, okay, from a single shot. The temporal resolution is determined by the temporal speckle, you know, size. And that's inversely proportional to our, the bandwidth of the input, uh, you know, pulse, the reference pulse we are, in, we are using. So in this case, it's about 200 femtoseconds. That depends on the pulse we're using. And uh, what is the temporal range that we can cover from a single shot? That's, that's inversely proportional. Uh, that's determined by this temporal you know, trace, how long this uh, uh, spatial you know, temporal speckle, uh, what is the uh, temporal range of this uh, you know, uh, you know, output uh, time trace. And this uh, length of this time trace is really inversely proportional to the spectral correlation from, you know, width, which I just mentioned in the previous part, because that depends on how much this uh, fiber can stretch the signal in time. And that basically tells us uh, how much we can cover in this uh, time domain. So in this particular case, we're using about one point, uh, it's just a little bit more than one meter long fiber. So our uh, temporal range about 35 picoseconds. So then uh, typically people talk about this so-called a 10 bandwidth product, which is a ratio of the range divided by the temporal resolution. And in this case, we have about 179. So eventually what really uh, determine this? What determine this at the end of the day, it is a how many independent temporal traces we can generate by the multimode fiber to probe an unknown you know, uh, signal. And so uh, that's also depend on the, by the number of uh, guiding modes in this multiple type. So if you have a thousand modes, then you can have 10 bandwidth about 1,000. Of course, uh, as we said, uh, you can also using a multi-mode fiber bundle to try to increase, the, you know, increase this kind of 10 bandwidth product. And also we can independently adjust the temporal resolution and the temporal range. The temporal resolution, as I said, if you're using a, a larger bandwidth of a reference pulse, then you can have a finer, you know, temporal resolution. If you are using like a longer fiber or a more dispersive fiber, uh, uh, we have a larger differential group delay, then we can increase the temporal range. So we can, you know, adjust this two, I mean, uh, resolution and the range separately in this multimode fiber. So let me try to summarize the second part of my talk. So, so basically I show you that we can have, uh, you know, using a multi-mode fiber for a single shot 
full field measurement. Uh, basically, if we have a known optical pulse, we can send through a multi-mode fiber to generate this so for the complex deterministic spatial temporal field at the fiber output. And then we can use this to really uh, sample an unknown field. And then from that, we actually can recover both amplitude and the phase. Sorry? No, it's just noise. Okay. So now what is the advantage for these things here? Because we're doing an interfere, a linear interfere geometry. So this can give us high sensitivity. Okay. And, um, uh, but what is the limitation? We need a reference pulse. Okay. We, we need a known pulse uh, to generate this kind of spatial temporal speckle. But I have to be careful to say that we do need a reference pulse, but we do not exactly know the, you know, the shape. If we don't know it, we can still recover some information. So for example, if I want to cover the response of a sample and I have a pulse, but I don't know exactly what is their you know, uh, spatial temporal field profile, uh, sorry, their spectral field profile or temporal field profile. So what can I still recover the sample response? We, again, we do the same thing as we did before. We put this in a reference arm. So then in this case, uh, this T is a time-resolved uh, transmission matrix from the multi-mode fiber, which we know. But what is we can recover, it is the reference, you know, signal field and at times this, uh, you know, uh, the reference pulse field times the signal, which is a transmission through this, uh, you know, sample. So we can only recover the product. We cannot recover separately. But then we can do one more measurement is we remove the sample. And then if in this case, what we measure, we measure only the reference you know, field. So now from this two, uh, with and without sample in the reference arm, we can do a divide, then we can measure the sample response in time without knowing the, exactly the reference pulse shape. So this basically tells us we can still get information if we don't exactly know what is this reference pulse you know, amplitude and phase, but we still need, a, you know, another reference pulse. So the last part uh, of my talk, I want to show you we don't need this reference pulse. Okay, so how we can do that? So let me just uh, try to say the first part I'd show you, we can recover spectral amplitude, right? Uh, or the spectrum uh, from this, uh, you know, uh, output, uh, you know, a speckle pattern. Uh, this is just, uh, you know, just, uh, and then uh, what we really, uh, you know, need is to recover spectral phase. And this, uh, uh, if we know the spectral phase, then we know that the full field, and then from that, we actually can recover for the trans and we get this, you know, amplitude phase in the time domain. So the question is how we can recover spectral phase, okay, uh, from the output spectral pattern, okay, uh, without a reference, without any reference pulse. So, uh, uh, so let's consider we have some unknown, you know, uh, you know, signal that is have amplitude on the phase, and uh, uh, we send through a multi-mode fiber, and like what we did before, they generate speckle patterns, and then we if we 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 call a linear speckle pattern, which means uh, we're just uh, using a one photon absorption uh, to really uh, get the intensity distribution. This is like say if we come in, it's a 1500 nanometer signal. We're just using a Know, IR camera to measure this uh, you know, uh, intensity distribution from um, you know, this uh, one photon absorption. So if this is our input field and then the output field, again, yeah, you can see, do this times the, this is frequency resolved uh, you know, uh, transmission matrix through the multi-mode fiber times the input spectral field. If you output the spectral field, then you Fourier transform it, you get output, you know, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, amplitude and phase, right? Uh, you know, uh, for at a different frequency at a different time. So that's what we got. And then uh, if we do using slow camera, then we measure time integrated, you know, uh, speckle pattern. We just uh, square this and then integrate in time. So if you just, uh, it's just a very simple, uh, you know, a mass will tell us this one, this we call the linear speckle pattern, only depend on the input, uh, uh, you know, field amplitude. It does all depend on the phase. That's why we can only recover the spectral amplitude. Is we cannot, uh, you know, recover spectral phase. 
So how we can recover spectral phase? We need to have, you know, doing we, we talk about a nonlinear spectral pattern. So what's a nonlinear spectral pattern? We come in, as I said, like 1.555, um, 1.55, you know, micron. Then the output we don't measure using an IR camera. We we're using a silicon camera. We know silicon camera cannot absorb in one photon at a 1.55 micron, you know, just because their 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 band, uh, you know, you know, their band gap is larger than this uh, photon, you know, uh, h bar omega energy. But they can do two photon absorption. So that means that if we, there's two photon that can be absorbed, uh, that give us this uh, so the, this kind of a non we call it a nonlinear speckle pattern. So now if we consider this uh, time integrated, again, we don't do a fast measurement, two photon absorption. That is basically output the field. If you, uh, now we don't squirt it because we have to do force power because this is a two photon absorption. And that gives us this a two photon speckle pan. So uh, then we try to see what determines this a two photon, uh, you know, uh, it's a kind of absorption pattern. Again, we do this for a transform. Uh, to, to, to get into the frequency domain. And uh, then this integration time, if just uh, after a few lines, you will see this is really complicated, right? So this is really complicated, but this is all, this is the base data time result, you know, uh, you know frequency result of transmission matrix for the multi mode fiber at a different frequency. And then, you know, and then this is the amplitude and this is the phase. But what is important is that here, this nonlinear speckle pattern, depend on the, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, spectral phase. So that means for this uh, nonlinear spectral pattern, different phase, they beat, they interfere with each other to determine this uh, nonlinear spectral pattern or determine how strong this two-phone absorption will be. And because of that, this two-photon, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, spectral pattern will contain the spectral phase information of the input. And that can allow us to retrieve it. So that's basically what we try to do. And uh, we have some advantage compared to the standard, um, uh, many reference free, uh, you know, temporal measurement. Because if you know that people do this autocorrelation, right? They can using this to try to recover, uh, you know, temporal pulse shape without a reference. But uh, this autocorrelation is always symmetric. You cannot tell whether it is the direction of time. That's because it cannot really, uh, you know, tell what is a sign of the spectral phase. For example, let's consider if we have this uh, input has a bandwidth here, right? And then there's uh, some phase. So, so this is a spectral amplitude. This is a spectral phase, okay? Now, if we see what they generate, they generate this temporal pulse shape like that. If we flip, uh, so this is a two photon spectral pattern, you know, that can, this is a, a simulation. Now, if we change the sign of the spectral phase, okay, we inverse it. Now, if you see the temporal pulse shape is really just the inverse in time, okay? But uh, for the two photon spectral pattern, it is sensitive to the spectral phase, the sign of the spectral phase. So therefore the two photon spectral pattern is different. So that means this two photon spectral pattern will allow us to tell the direction of time or can tell us you know, this, uh, you know, this uh, sign of the spectral phase. Okay, that's because of this complexity of the dynamics in this multi-model fiber. We don't have this kind of symmetry, uh, you know, allow, you know, to really uh, have this you know, ambiguity. So that is the advantage using this kind of complex. So now how we do that experimentally. So we basically, uh, you know, sending this unknown pulse. Uh, I'll show you uh, later what we are uh, trying to do the measurement. We basically send through this multi-model fiber then actually here we split it into two, uh, you know, arms. One we're using the in, this is the in infrared light. One we measure this, uh, you know, one photon absorption. You know, we call a linear spectral pattern. Another we're using a silicon camera. We measure two photon spectral pattern. So from this uh, linear spectral pattern, we can recover the spectral amplitude, and from the two uh, photon spectral pattern, we try to recover the phase. I mean, uh, spectral phase. So to do that, we need to again calibrate. We need to calibrate what is the time, uh, sorry, frequency resolved transmission matrix through this multi-mode fiber. So uh, 
then if we know that, this actually we have already done this before, so in the uh, previous part of the talk. So if we uh, know that, and then if we have any unknown pulse, then we're just uh, doing this, we, we can find that we know what is uh, this two bond cycle pattern. But what is the problem? The problem is that if you know the input pulse, it's very easy to calculate two photon cycle pattern. But uh, the problem is that that's not what we want to do. We want to, uh, you know, do the inverse part. We want to, uh, from the measure of two photons to the nonlinear spectral pattern, we want to recover this, uh, you know, spectral phase at the input. And this is really a, you know, a, a complex nonlinear mapping. We want to, from here, try to figure out what is this, okay? So, of course, you can say, how about we do this uh, phase retrieval? Actually, we tried this several years to do this uh, phase retrieval. But the question is, uh, it's not reliable because we have measurement noise. If I measurement noise, this kind of a re phase retrieval is not very reliable. Sometimes it works, sometimes it just does not work. So that is actually, it is an issue. So because of, you know, we are desperate because we cannot really get a reliable phase retrieval. And so that's what we decided to go to try machine learning. And uh, so, uh, and we think this is really a nice example to do machine learning because we want to recover this, uh, we want to use machine learning to learn this inverse mapping, which is nonlinear, okay, and, and also complex, okay. There's just no other measure we can know to really get this into working. So, uh, so what we do, we are actually uh, using this convolutional neural network. We basically send in the two photon cycle pattern, okay, and then, uh, you know, we are basically using this, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, maybe this uh, neural network, they try to do convolute uh, different spatial uh, filters with this uh, input, uh, you know, uh, image, try to extract new features. They're using different spatial filters uh, so that they extract the different, uh, you know, uh, features. And then the most important features will be selected from this so-called max pooling. Uh, and then from that, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, features will be go to the next, uh, you know, layer. Then they do this kind of, you know, ex extraction again. So at the end, uh, you know, uh, there's a, the, you know, the last few layers of this neural network, they try to flatten out all these, uh, you know, features, important features that are extracted from this, uh, you know, image. And then they try to give us the output, which is spectral phase we want. And we usually using this called the ResNet. It is a small neural network that actually uh, has a small number of parameters. So it is uh, avoid overfitting and also it is faster to train. But then in order to do the training, we need a, you know, many training data. So how do we generate the, uh, like a lot of training data to train? So of course you can say experimentally, we can generate different pulses. We send it to the fiber, we measure two photon cycle pattern, we do the training. That's very expensive and also very time consuming. Then you say, how about we do a numerical model? We just try to model this, uh, you know, multi-mode fiber. And then we send in, if we know this, uh, uh, you know, how this multi-mode fiber works in a propagate, light propagating in there, then we can just use this general numerical model, you know, data. But the problem is this fiber has, you know, random fluctuations in the refract index. There's micro banding, twisting. It's just impossible to really model this multi-mode fiber. You know, how that probably can sue it because we don't have enough accuracy to do that. So then we decided to do this hybrid, you know, like to synthesize data using the measured transmission matrix for this particular fiber. Because then uh, we know for this particular fiber, this is the transmission matrix. And then we actually uh, numerically generate many different, you know, uh, spectral amplitude phase. Then this was very easy to color two photon spectral pattern. Then we're using this synthesized data to train the neural network. So this will be much faster and also efficient. So now the question, we also don't want to, you know, we also want to reduce the number of parameters that this neural network has to predict. Okay. So then the, for the spectral phase, if you think about for a single pulse, the spectral phase only have a typically is really, really very smooth state with the previous. So therefore, we only have a few parameters there that is basically written as this uh, polynomial. 
And uh, so basically uh, uh, showing this, actually this is the frequency uh, difference, uh, you know, uh, between the standard frequency and uh, that one there. So the first one is just a constant phase. So that doesn't matter. The second one is a linear one that's just a chirp that does not depend on this, uh, uh, you know, the shape of this. So I saw the chairman has a stand up. So I will try to finish. Okay. Uh, how many time do I have? Uh, Zero. <laughs> okay, zero. All right. Okay, so I'll try to do that very quickly because um, sorry for this, uh, you know. So now what we really care is the second, the third, and the fourth. That I mean, this uh, those terms because those tells the frequency chirping and the distortion. So that's uh, but that's for single pulse. For if you have multiple pulse, they are going to interfere in the frequency domain. And then they actually uh, have this kind of uh, fringes. They have this uh, minimum that can, can give this a phase jump. And those phase jump, actually, if we recover the spectrum, then we know where the frequency dip is, but we don't know what is the phase jump it is. So we can add in this heavy set function plus some phase jump there, you know, at this uh, minimum. So we only have a few parameters we need to recover. So I really need, okay. So this is just a, uh, one last two uh, thing here. So basically we show that we can using the synthesized, uh, you know, uh, we can measure, we can recover the spectrum and we have a synthesized phase. We synthesize this, uh, you know, input a pulse shape and then we generate two photon uh, cycle uh, patterns. And we adding the noise into this and then we put into the CN and then we try to, pre you know, try to predict what is a, a output a phase with a few parameters. Then we compare to the, you know, the actual one. And then from this arrow, we can try to update the weight. And then from that, we can train the CN. And then from any, then after that, from the measure one, we can uh, get this recovered phase here. Okay. So now let's try to see uh, what I said before, the noise is very important because the, that's why the phase retrieval failed. So we have introducing noise into this kind of training. So if we don't introduce noise into this training, we, we see that the, if we do the, you know, the uh, training, and then we see what is arrow, that's blue, and then we do validation, and that's also, uh, say they have a similar arrows there, right? But if we uh, try to put in the noise, sorry, if we put in the noise into the test data, additional test data, we see the arrow is very large. So what we did is we adding the noise into this training so that this, uh, you know, this validation arrow is uh, larger than the training arrow. That's basically tell us this is uh, like uh, overfitting because noise cannot be learned. But then when we do a test with another set of data with the noise, actually the arrow is similar to the validation. So basically I'll try to go very quickly. So I try to try to show you that with this kind of noise input into the system, we really can uh, you know, recover any arbitrary spectral amplitude and the phase here. And then that is actually turns out to be much more successful than just a regular phase retrieval. So here shows a one photon, two photon spectral pattern. And uh, we see this is a recovered spectral amplitude and the phase. And this is a, then from that, we can get a temporal you know, shape of the pulse. And we actually, as I said, we can tell that this uh, you know small you know side peak is at the front, not at the end. This is in contrast to this uh, you know autocorrelation, which is give you a symmetrical spectrum, and the predicted two photon cycle pattern is the same as the measured one. Okay, uh, so uh, what is the temporal resolution we can get? That depends on what is the spectral range we are calibrate our multimodal type, and uh, and what determines the you know the, this is the temporal resolution. What determines the temporal uh, range? That's again spectral collision with of the fiber, which we can make longer. Finally, the, the problem is time bandwidth a product that's limited by the number of guided modes in the fiber. And that one, again, we can use the multimodal fiber bundle to really increase it. So, okay, with that, I'll finish that part of my talk. I showed you we can do the self reference method, categorize the optical pulse using a convolutional neural network. We're using a linear spectral pattern to give us spectral amplitude. Nonlinear spectral pattern give us a spectral phase. And uh, the advantage is a single shot, a simple setup, no moving parts, no ambiguity in the direction of time, and also robust against the noise. I must say that there's a, also a work by Professor Modi Sagave's group. They say they're actually just using a nonlinear 
you know, uh, spiral pattern, they can recover both amplitude and phase. So we don't need to do two measurements. So finally, I want to say to conclude is that multi-mode fiber, as I said, is a complex system. It's really covered the degree of freedom in space, spectrum, time, polarization, all together. So they allow us to do a spectral measurement, temporal measurement, hyperspectral imaging, polarization measurement. So this is really a multifunctional platform uh, for, you know, sensing. So this is basically, uh, I would like to acknowledge all the people who have contributed to this work. Finally, uh, thank you for your attention. Sorry, I'm, I went a bit longer. Any questions from the online audience? I see a question on chat. Say, uh, which image augmentation techniques do you use if you need to deal with uh, overfitting uh, in CN? So uh, we actually don't use any uh, image aug I mean, augmentation. Actually, we're using something very simple in this machine learning. Uh, we uh, mostly what uh, I'm sure there's much I mean better way to do it. So what we do here is that we kind of know how much noise we have in our you know in our measurement. So what we do is that uh, we just uh, we 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 have this uh, synthesized image. Then we're just adding some, you know, stochastic noise because we know our noise is kind of stochastic noise. We're adding this noise uh, into the I mean, into the training data, and then we're just sending that uh, uh, into this neural network, and then try to uh, train it. Um, of course, when you're putting an and if you this is what you're using about uh, you know a thousand you know different uh, two photon cycle for training, that means we generate another two thousand. We putting a different noise. Of course, there is this kind of overfitting things because they cannot learn the noise. But we just uh, really take it because we don't want the the neural network to learn the noise. No noise is something that can be learned, right? So basically, we want to focus on something which is not a noise. So we still uh, you know. Uh, just keeping this kind of uh, you know arrow in this um, in this uh, so we do have an arrow between the evaluation data. Oops, I somehow I got uh, you know uh, I cannot go back. So basically um, I, I cannot go back. Okay. Anyway, so um, we uh, we actually uh, just a uh, evaluation arrow. It is larger than the training arrow. But the test error is almost the same as the evaluation error. That's what we are going for. Okay, there's one more. There's another question from the chat. Can you read it? Okay. Have you tried another ResNet architecture like ResNet 50 or, or are too large for this time? Uh, actually, uh, thank you for this information. Uh, thank you for this question. We, as I said, we're not really good at machine learning, so we are actually just trying to use the simplest thing, which is a ResNet 18. That is a few years ago. I'm sure right now there are much better things like, uh, you know, as you said, maybe ResNet 50. That could be much more efficient. And uh, so, uh, actually, we got a, a fairly good result, so we just uh, stop there. But as I said, uh, if we want to recover both amplitude because spectral amplitude and phase both encoded in this uh, nonlinear, uh, you know, spectral pattern. If we want to recover both of them, I think, I mean, accurately, I think we probably need to using uh, like uh, what you said, more advanced, uh, you know, newer network architectures. Yeah, I do think there's a lot of way to improve it. Right now we measure linear, nonlinear, you know, separately to recover spectral amplitude and phase. You can recover everything from uh, just a nonlinear spectral pattern because they also have spectral amplitude. But then this is a much uh, worse inverse problem. Uh, so, or much more complicated. So I think uh, advanced one could be very helpful. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, can I, 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 because I have another question. Uh, which so software do you use to, to simulate? Sorry? Uh, which, which type of which software do you use to simulate the propagation of the of the modes along the along the fiber? Oh, okay. So sorry, I I uh, I was just uh, just uh, so we are not really uh, simulating as I 
as we said, simulating is very hard because we cannot simulate a realistic fiber. So we actually, what we do is we measure the field of transmission matrix. Uh, let me see whether I can still uh, reshare my screen because it's got freezed here. That is the key here is that we don't simulate the fiber. We can't get it accurately now. So what we do is we measure the field transmission matrix for this particular fiber we use in the experiment. And then we're using this uh, measure transmission matrix times all this like uh, different, you know, uh, you know, antenna phase, try to generate a two photon cycle pattern. This is much more efficient because it is more realistic and also we don't need to really experiment to generate the training data. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, I think this is time to end and thanks. Yes, one last question, please. Let me speak. Just loud. Just Yeah? Loud. Yes, so you, you have a transmission matrix which is linear. So what about uh, in the case when your pulses are uh, strong enough that you have a nonlinear propagation? Would that be possible to, would that improve uh, uh, your sensitivity or would be uh, detrimental to, to, uh, to enter the nonlinear propagation regime where the modes are coupled by nonlinearity? Yeah, this is a very good question. Actually, uh, you see, I put the nonlinear only at the end because if I, I, I want to hide with the pulse shape, right? So I don't want, I don't care how large the energy is, right? So that's why I want to stay in a linear regime because in the linear regime, when I have a different pulse energy things here, if it's a linear regime, then my, I mean, my output of this uh, two photon cycle pattern is still the same. That's why I put uh, the nonlinearity uh, on the outside. If I put it inside here, then this cycle pattern would, uh, you know, not only determined by the pulse shape, it's also de determined by the pulse energy. So, so, so that means we need a, a lot more calibration. <laughs> we really need to calibrate this thing for different, um, you know, different pulse energy here. So, uh, so, so that's why we had to using a highly multi-mode fibers so that uh, we try to avoid this, uh, um, we try to avoid the non-linear effect in this case. If I have a too high pulse, we actually try to, sh you know, attenuate it at the input to stay in the linear region because then I can have this uh, field transmission matrix. If I go to non-linear region, I don't have field transmission matrix anymore and that calibration will be a lot more difficult. But maybe there's a chance that can pro provide more information, uh, but we have not thought about that yet. <laughs> okay, this is time to end and thank uh, Wei again. And good luck with the new teaching year. Oh. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Hope to see you next time. Uh, at Como. Uh, sorry, I cannot be there. Okay, take care. Bye bye. Uh, What's this?